So welcome once again. Uh, we're going to continue our sessions uh, now. So I will introduce the next moderator. So it is Agnes Casira. She is a previous president of Eurodoc. She is an engineer from Poland, early career researchers as us, and she has for many years actually been part of advocacy initiatives. So please, uh, Agnieszka. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody. Uh, the next uh, panel session will be as well interesting as the previous one. We'll talk about uh, about academic freedom, uh, a prerequisite for a sustainable future. I would like to introduce our first speaker, who will be Amanda uh, Crawford. Uh, she is the Secretary General. Okay, Amanda, can you hear us? Yes, I, I can hear you now, yes. Perfect. Okay, so Amanda is uh, Secretary General of the European University Association, which is the collective voice of European universities with over uh, 850 members. She is responsible for implementing the association's strategic plan, acting as an ambassador for its members and leading a secretariat of over 40 staff members. Amanda previously served as a director of Science Europe and was responsible for establishing its office in Brussels in 2012 yeah. and developing and implementing implementing its policy agenda. From 2001 to 2012, Amanda worked as a UK research office. Uh, first as a European advisor and then as a director of the office. In these roles, she worked closely with uh, universities in UK and uh, beyond, assisting them uh, in accessing EU fundings and defining their strategies for European engagement. With a background in linguistic, Amanda taught and researched at several UK universities and was projects manager at the Center for Research and Policy in Disability at Convert University. Amanda, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm very sorry that I can't be with you in person. Uh, so just before I talk about academic freedom, just a couple of words about the European University Association. We're the largest European association of universities. We have over 850 members in all countries of the European higher education area. So that's 49 countries. And effectively, we act as, a vo as the voice of Europe's universities. We provide a platform for collaboration between universities. We advocate on their behalf. And we also gather evidence um, around anything related to higher education. Um, academic freedom is a topic that's very important to us. It's one of our core values and it's an area on which we've been working for, for many years now. And um, I think the first point I would like to make about academic freedom is that on one hand, it's very easy to define. We, we know what it is. It's about you know, the freedom to research and publish and speak and study unconstrained by, by, by you know, political constraints and so, or, um, or, or other constraints. But on the other hand, it's very hard to define because it's actually such a complex area with such a diversity of different challenges. So on one hand, you have many examples of blatant uh, violations of academic freedom where you can and also institutional autonomy, which is a kind of related um, topic, obviously. Um, so, you know, if you talk about things uh, like where you can see an area of study being banned in a particular country, these are very clear, very obvious um, um, examples of academic freedom um, by uh, um, infringement. But there are, on the other hand, there are lots of other more subtle th threats which are experienced by universities, by researchers throughout Europe and the world. So, for example, we see growing constraints around funding where, where funding is available. We see um, excessive regulation in places. We see the stifling of unpopular views um, on campuses and issues around freedom of speech. And so these may not be the kind of, you know, really, really blatant academic freedom violations in the same way, but they still have impact on research and education systems and they're detrimental to the overall intellectual life of, of universities and researchers. 
But the fact they're all very different means they can't all be dress, addressed in the same way. So we need, when talking about academic freedom, to be talking about sort of differentiated responses, depending on the kind of type of challenges um, that, that there are. Um, on a positive note, although I think recently, uh, globally, we have seen a number of infringements to academic freedom, I think we've also seen a lot of development in terms of the protection of academic freedom and a growing recognition of the fact that academic freedom will not protect itself, which I think is very important. So, for example, in recent years, there have been many different high level statements of support on academic freedom. We had the European Higher Education Area Paris Communique in 2018. We had the Bonn Declaration on Freedom of Scientific Research. We had a report on academic freedom by the UN Special Rapporteur. So, so lots of things going on in this space. And also we see at the moment really keen political interest in this. So the European Parliament is very engaged in the topic as I'm sure you all know. It's also a key part of the Bologna process with lots of work going on in that space. And we also see lots of different monitoring exercises. So we have um, an academic freedom in, um, um, index. We have work going on in the um, Bologna follow-up group um, on values. We have work going on with the European through the European Commission in, in the um, in, in terms of the European strategy for universities. And we have all of the European Parliament work too. So many, many things going on. Um, you could argue there's a need to streamline these a little bit because there's so much going on, but I think it's positive that, that there are so many kind of steps in the right direction. There's also, um, as you'll know, a lot of talk at the moment about legal provisions and whether or not there could be regulations or legislation around academic freedom. And I think what I'd like to say about these is that, that legal provisions can be very useful tools, but they must be fit for purpose and they must be properly implemented. And it's really important when thinking about this, when thinking about legislation and when thinking about sanctions, to be aware of the possibility of unintended consequences, um, if you like, of punishing the wrong people or, or, or the, the wrong levels within the system. Uh, I'd also like to point out that um, in terms of legal provision, there are also num a number of countries around Europe that already have provision for academic freedom enshrined in their law. So it's not something that doesn't exist. It's something that very much is there already. But also the fact that academic freedom is enshrined in law doesn't always necessarily mean that the protection is automatically there in practice. So, for example, we see situation like Hungary, where the law does protect academic freedom, but where we have seen things where there are infringements of academic freedom and institutional autonomy. So I think then, as you can see, academic freedom is complex. And I think very importantly, there is a need for us to openly reflect on the contradictions and the challenges that are involved in balancing academic freedom with the strategic decision making of universities. So just a couple of examples here. How far can you go in prioritizing and incentivizing research before you curtail the freedom of researchers to choose their own field of study? So let's take something like climate change. We'd all agree that research is really important and necessary on climate change. But how much can a government, for example, dictate exactly what's going to be studied and to what extent in this area before you're infringing on academic freedom? And then the second example, how do you balance the need for openness in, in research with really legitimate concerns over security or over um, collaboration with international partners who might not respect academic freedom? So I'm not saying I have the answers to these questions, but I think these are issues that are faced by universities every single day and they need constant reflection and discussion. And they also need consideration on a case by case basis. These are not always something that can be dealt with by one top down policy um, initiative, because it is very much case to case depending on the particular circumstance. So I will just finish with a couple of uh, points about what, what should universities be doing then in our view at EUA. 
Um, I think the, the most important thing is that universities should be raising awareness of academic freedom internally within, their insti within the institutions. And this may be developing policies, it may be highlighting and sharing problems, you know, providing a forum to discuss these issues. It may be in sharing best practice. But the key thing is to have the discussions and put it on the table actively and not just wait for the problems to occur. I think the next thing is that it's really important that universities create a culture where academic freedom is the norm and where it is, as I say, discussed openly and, and regularly. It needs to very much be part of the DNA of a university that this is a core value. And the third thing, and I think particularly relevant to, to this audience here today, is that we absolutely have to recognize the crucial role in students, of students, doctoral candidates, early career researchers, as ambassadors of, in, of academic freedom and integrity. And so I think it's great to have this discussion today. Um, I'm really thrilled that Eurodoc is getting into this topic, and I really look forward to discussing it all with you further in the course of this session. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda, for your input. You showed that uh, the problem is really complex, and you also showed, point out, uh, that we should consider uh, it on uh, uh, different levels. That's why I would like to ask now the, the next speaker, uh, who will be uh, Jakob Fartner, who is the current vice president of Cerveris Foranda student, okay, SFS. Uh, he holds a bachelor degree in political science. He's a member of a working group uh, consisting of uh, SFS, SUHF and SULF. Uh, which is working uh, on strengthening academic freedom in Slovenia. So that would be a point of view for uh, from students also. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity to address this uh, important topic. Uh, I would like to take uh, the, this perspective from, from the students part, and of course, uh, mainly in, in my speech here now for the uh, the the undergraduate and postgraduate students in regards to academic freedom, because uh, SFS represents students across the whole country, but also at all uh, educational levels uh, in the higher education sector. Uh, so, and also some examples from, from Sweden, I would also like to point out in, in regards to academic freedom. Uh, so you can ask yourself, uh, what is the state of mind of academic freedom in, in Sweden? Uh, despite being renowned for quite uh, high quality research and education, uh, we have seen over time uh, challenges towards uh, academic freedom. Uh, and this has been uh, reflected, for example, in the uh, last report from the EUA, in their autonomy report, we can see that Sweden is getting low scores in, in regards to autonomy. And, and we can also see, if we look historically, that uh, Swedish politicians, they like to strive towards academic freedom. They like to speak about academic freedom. Uh, you can see that, especially in their rhetoric, you can see that uh, most of our politicians like to mention the word freedom, academic freedom, that this is something positive. Uh, you can also see this in uh, um, official government report from the Swedish states that uh, most of our uh, suggestions are the large reforms in, in the higher education sector. Uh, they are all often named something freedom. Uh, so uh, we like, of course, to, uh, <laughs> to mention academic freedom uh, and the politicians uh, like to talk the talk, as you say. Uh, so the next question is, uh, do they walk the walk uh, regarding academic freedom? Uh, and I have some examples here from Sweden. Uh, and I must first bring up one crucial uh, aspect that impacts students and that is the uh, we have seen over a long time that Swedish governments have a tendency to want to control the education uh, what kinds of uh, uh, things the students should be learning about and this has been consistent over time we have seen this both from social democratic uh, governments uh, regarding example the school teacher programs here in Sweden uh, but also right now uh, from the right-wing government uh, when they want to control uh, what social worker students should should learn. Uh, so this is consistent over time and we see that uh, the politicians uh, try to create specific learning objectives and goals in the Swedish Higher Education Act to especially uh, make students learn uh, things that are in line with their political, political agenda. 
And of course, I see uh, with my as, with the members of my organization and students that this is affecting the education. Of course, it's disrupting the learning and, and the free thinking. Uh, so the second thing I would like to point out as well in regards to Sweden, I must bring up the financial system. Uh, since the 90s, we have a financial system that every year decreases in funding. Uh, so the education gets uh, less money uh, every year, basically. Uh, and of course, this uh, also limits the academic freedom of students. Uh, you are not available to to, uh, to educate in all things you would like. Or, for example, if you want to write a, a paper, there's the limitations of what you can do and, and your research and so on. So I can see the financial system is always also affecting how we learn and what we learn in our critical thinking. Uh, and uh, thirdly, one uh, thing also that is a bit more abstract, but we can see that there's a distrust in Sweden between the state and the higher education institutions. Uh, and we can see this in several ways that, for example, over time, we can see that the external amount, uh, the, the amount of external research funding uh, for the universities have increased. So there are more and more money going to the uh, governmental research councils and not to the universities. Uh, and we recently also had another example when you talk about steering of the universities that uh, the Swedish government wanted to uh, change the board members or their, their terms of office uh, because uh, I have the quote here, they wanted to secure that all members have skills and knowledge about the security policy because of the situation in, in Europe and China, of course, uh, even though the higher education already are working with this in Sweden. So it's a, a, another example of academic freedom in Sweden going uh, on the wrong side. And, and fourthly, and uh, lastly, I would like to point out in Sweden, we have a very weird system from my point of view, being a social scientist, uh, that the higher education institutions are under the same regulations as the other uh, governmental uh, agencies. Uh, so, of course, uh, it makes ensures some accountability and, and transparency, but it also uh, makes a, a very clear connection to the state and the state can control the higher education institutions in in a much broader way. Uh, so to conclude, uh, for me and my fellow students, the members of SFS, um, I think that we are less and less believing in that the state will uphold the values of academic freedom in, in the higher education sector. And uh, it's very clear to me when I speak to students that, that all of these things that the government has been doing over the years is affecting the education and also in the long, long run, of course, affecting academia as a whole. And if you talk in regards to this conference, of course, affects uh, doctoral students in the long run and, and also the future researchers. Um, so yes, um, we have considered that uh, the politicians in Sweden don't do, uh, they don't walk the walk. And uh, my final words is to encourage all to care about academic freedom, believe in academic freedom. And uh, yeah, there's no politicians here, I believe so, but uh, uh, <laughs> I would like them to also walk the walk and uh, take care of these questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your feedback and that you pointed out that academic freedom we have to protect and we have to take care from the level of uh, of uh, studies. So that, that was really important. Thank you very much. Uh, then I would like to introduce the next speaker. It will be Shell Nielsen, who is a senior lecturer in psychology at Lund University. He is a representative of uh, Pakrundbundet. ST, uh, where he for many years uh, has been responsible specifically for issues related to research policy, PhD education, and academic freedom. Shell and uh, Pakbundet ST uh, has for many years been a, a vocal critic of the weak protection of academic freedom in Sweden. Uh, apologize if I pronounce wrongly the name of the organization. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I will try not to repeat what already been said here. Uh, what you said about, you know, constitutional legal protection of academic freedom, uh, it's just a document that not necessarily is followed, which is often the case in Sweden. Uh, the law is just the law. But so I will concentrate on other things like employment security and also the institutional governance uh, of uh, of research and education, which is a very important issue, I think. Uh, I can say first that when it comes to employment uh, protection, uh, there 
as I have Peel here, is Danish. I can take a Danish example. Uh, their employment protection is even worse uh, than here in Sweden. Uh, I have a colleague and friend uh, who's working as a professor in sociology in Copenhagen University. And uh, I think it was last year, he was, he and his colleagues were summoned and uh, the, the head of the department said that, I want you all to sit in front of the computer Monday morning at nine o'clock and I will tell you who get fired. Uh, so I understand that employment protection is of course a very important issue when it comes to actually being able or dare to uh, conduct free research and free education. So, uh, when it comes to institutional governance, uh, what our moderator just said that we in trade union ST have been trying to warn for for at least 15 years is actually that the institutional protection of academic freedom in Sweden is very weak. And as was mentioned before too, that when studies are made about uh, academic freedom or the, the protection of it, it, it's a legal and institutional framework is very weak. We have in Sweden, we have a majority of government appointed members of the university board. That was the same thing that happened in Denmark 2003. Uh, it was also that Sweden had a higher education reform in 2011 when what was stated in the higher education ordinance that uh, universities should elect uh, faculty boards, uh, departmental boards, dean, head of departments, etc. Uh, that regulation was abolished. So each university since then implement their own, you can say, local constitution. And it's only very few universities who actually retained that collegial rule, meaning that the collegium is actually electing the leaders and boards. Uppsala and Lund, where I come from, is actually one of the two of the few, I think, that actually have a local constitution that actually uh, have similar to the governance as before. As I remember, it was even then in 2011, it was also uh, deregulated in the sense that uh, uh, to have external reviewers where you appointed uh, lecturer positions, for instance, teaching positions, that that is not, not necessary anymore with external reviewers. It can be any internal appointed by People like Peter here, <laughs> for instance. Uh, full professors are still have a uh, kind of the need to have external reviewers. Uh, I will also say one more thing that actually was on the agenda I saw in this uh, conference book. It has to do with how is academic freedom for, for instance, PhD students and postdocs. Uh, and here it differs quite a lot. Uh, uh, Jakob mentioned the funding system. Uh, if you look at where we come, me and Jakob from social sciences, sociology and so on, political science, uh, a much bigger, bigger proportion of PhD students and so on uh, are funded by you know, university grants directly from state. So it's easier for them to actually decide which dissertation topic they want to research, do research about. If we go to medicine or science where most of the funding for PhD students come from external grants, <coughs> where the professor or the supervisor, the PI, take in the money and then employ basically PhD students. The freedom, of course, it's much, much less. Uh, in worst cases, uh, those relations are sometimes almost feudal, I would say, <laughs> very rockable and so on, right? Uh, I will finish off, I think, by, by uh, well, I suppose like Peter's going to take the word, uh, this was mentioned, this intervention that the government now do to trying to politicize uh, even further the university boards, uh, the members appointed by government, uh, and uh, thereby potentially uh, taking control. Uh, I would recommend rectors uh, who have been very critical to this actually to try to build up defense walls, and that could be actually to reintroduce collegial rule, at least under 
the university boards because then you have more easy way to resist uh, politicians trying to take over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your input from like the governance of university. And the next speaker uh, who I would like to introduce is Peter Aronson, a professor in history and vice chancellor of Linnaeus University. Academic freedom and open science are core values in need of both principal defense and concrete operationalization. Please, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you. I don't think I have to repeat the uh, sort of um, core values of academic freedom. It has been said and stated already. Um, and But uh, I would also like to emphasize that they need to be safeguarded uh, in many ways, uh, as Shell was pointing out and Amanda has been pointing out. Uh, and it, it, we are crucial. The universities are crucial as institutions, how we are set up and how we manage these institutions, because being on your own you will be helpless you know so we we need to to be to safeguard that both uh to uh political and economic pressure and the question of autonomy which is not the same as academic freedom because we can we can misuse the autonomy as shell pointed out uh, but it needs to be there um, at an international level obvious threats uh, to academic freedom is the backlash of democratic institutions overall because uh, uh, that uh, strikes against uh, external pressure. It opened up for external pressure, and it we will also have weaker supply, which is necessary and necessary support both for students and universities. Other donators are of course welcome, uh, but needs to be held at arm length distance, not to discredit the independence and objectivity of knowledge production. The external threats of academic freedom are generic, uh, and I think they most have been uh, named here. It's it's both lack of funding, uh, but it's also the format of the funding. If it goes to to small directed, or if it comes in a in a in a bulk way where universities can use them more freely and and take that freedom down to the PhD students. Uh, if the short sightedness, uh, it might be with very good intentions, of course, like the sustainability issues that was named by Amanda. Um, uh, is, uh, and that's short sightedness, both from uh, pol politics and from university management that adopt to that system when we are so uh, hard connected to the government structure as we are in, in Sweden and in the other Nordic countries. Um, but I think I would like to add, um, yeah, also it has been mentioned, the, the geopolitical conflicts, Amanda mentioned that, that uh, might be spread to the global ac academy and, and, and hit the free exchange uh, that is also a necessary part of academic exchange. But I think we have some more sophisticated threats coming from within. Uh, and I don't think that has been mentioned uh, yet. I think we, we have a high regard of the peer review process, but there are backsides of that that might be very conservative and inward looking and uh, also nested. Uh, someone talked about feudal <laughs> orders here, and, and that can also happen within, uh, within research, so that it needs to have its uh, uh, checks and balances. Uh, it might also be a lack of a capacity, and I will, I will, I will dwell upon that a little bit. A lack of a capacity to move this uh, free academic knowledge outside to work in society, uh, and that's why I mentioned also open science in my uh, in my um, uh, in my lecture, uh, because that gives us credit if we can show that academic freedom is the basic, the core value but we also have an, uh, an um, ambition, at least on the institutional level, uh, and a successful ambition to move that knowledge outside to make for all these wishes that the, uh, the politicians have, and even make for them in a better way if there is more freedom in the, in the start uh, position of, of academy. Uh, and if we can't do that, uh, we will have a lack in trust in that. And then they would go, try to go to the solutions directly instead. 
and try to direct, and that will that will be worse. It it won't be so successful. So the open science system, which is very much acknowledged now, there are statements from the EU and from UNESCO and in the national system. Uh, I think it's quite easy to embrace it. It has lots of troubles, costs, etc. But it's it's easy to embrace it uh, in in a principal way because it's so close to the academic ethos of of universities. I would say it's it's um, the Enlightenment program digitalized, accelerated. Uh, but otherwise, it's nothing new really coming in. It's new that you need to. Um, it's not just archives and 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 text anymore. It's much more that you need to share. Uh, but we have a, a knowledge of how to do that, so we will, I think, manage that well. Uh, the mix um, of these threats might differ over the world. I'm I'm working also in IAU, uh, the International Association of Universities, but they are surprisingly generic. You'll find the same kind in Togo or in South America, the same principal uh, challenges, though it might, they might be different in strength. Uh, in Africa, it might be it hasn't been raining for two years and I don't an agricultural economy, but it's economy. <laughs> uh, so I, I agree that uh, it's a good idea to have a stronger constitutional protection, law protection. I think it's easy to have a united front from students, scholars, unions, universities. It's good, but it's not enough. We need much broader support. Laws and constitutions can and are turned around. So secondly, I think the strongest support lies in a credible and widespread understanding of the working of a fine-tuned and productive knowledge ecology. It's a long sentence and it's not even finished yet. Where universities have a unique role as pursuing research and designing education independent from direct political and economic interest, only looking for new and best possible knowledge. And then we take responsibility for moving that knowledge closer to the society through education and through the intersection and collaboration with the outside world. So that is, I mean, we we are doing that and the public, the politicians and other funders, they need to understand that the value chain start with the reservoir of free research. But as institutions, universities need to be able to package and hand over that knowledge uh, to the kind of challenge driven cluster of transdisciplinary knowledge areas that you can find in Agenda 2030. Um, and, and that will help to to, to work both in education and policy impact. Thirdly, I think that the open science system needs to be set to hand over the best, best possible knowledge also to economic actors, that we, we need them to transform to a more circular economy necessary for a sustainable future. The good news is that we are already doing this with great, if not perfect impact. COVID vaccine is just one example. The working of the ecosystem can absolutely be improved, but it's up and running. Contrary to many com common complaints of an ill-adjusted academic system in many countries. The bad news is therefore that we are not communicating this success and the systemic connection to the uh, systemic connection with between uh, uh, free academic freedom and uh, action-oriented research. We are not uh, communicating that successfully to the public, to the policymakers and industry. But there is even a worse news. <laughs> uh, and that is that, uh, and a more difficult task is uh, to counteract, is that we are actually not solving many challenges fast enough. Uh, and we are looked upon as participating and associated with an elite system that contribute to greater divide between rich and poor, both within nations and between nations in the world. Hence, we see a backlash, both in the support for the democratic system and its academy uh, spreading all over the world. Things are not going in the right direction. Widening circles of populist parties are listening and supporting authoritarian uh, lies and radical action 
that might satisfy a need for straw men and scapegoats to carry the guilt of present troubles, but it will lead to greater problems in the longer run. Again, the remedy is an academy working with the full value chain of basic free academic research, challenge-driven uh, packaging and research, and also applied sciences, where all faculties are mobilized and through open science work also through open sharing of research and education of best possible quality. This is why it's good and necessary not only to have excellent individual academics like yourselves, uh, but also universities that facilitate this systemic and collective eco services, which cannot be burdened on each and every academic, but we need to be better to communicate this to stakeholders. As this communication is uh, better and more efficient, if it is based on knowledge, this requires research, surprisingly <laughs> enough, uh, on the working of how open science really works and when and why it doesn't. Uh, it's a full research program, I think, we are talking about here, not just sort of lobbying and policy making. Uh, and it's surprisingly little research now. To finalize my argument, I think that insights in this system is the best way to future proof your academic career for as PhD students or young researchers. The ideal of the working of open science is already influencing the European and global idea of merit as we sign treatises like Quara, the Coalition of Advancing Research Assessment and the like. So keep updated uh, as the idea of quality is always uh, presented as universal and sort of never changing, but it's always changing and it's added new, new qualities. Uh, and I think um, this is the, the, the best way to, to, prove, to future proof your academic career to keep adjusted, keep your core value, uh, your role uh, as a free academic secure, but you must interact with the world outside because even if the academy is um, uh, needs to be independent, it also needs to interact successfully with the outside world. We are part of the world. Yeah, I'll stop that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, especially for underlying the importance of open science according to the uh, to the academic freedom. Thank you very much. And the next speaker will be Pil Maria Sauman, the representative of Eurodoc. Uh, she holds a PhD in theoretical physics from Stockholm University. She is currently secretariat coordinator uh, in Eurodoc and has been a part of Eurodoc's uh, task force on academic freedom for the past two years and is a co-author of the Eurodoc statement on academic freedom. She has a long history of advocacy work uh, and have previously been uh, the chair of the doctoral council. Sweden. Peel, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a bit hard of it to follow the last four speakers. Um, because most of what I would have liked to say has already been said, and that's both like a curse, but it is also a blessing. Uh, so I can maybe flip it a bit around. And um, first of all, I think it's important to notice that the question of academic freedom is not a question that is localized to Sweden or localized to Poland, localized to Slovenia, localized to Italy, localized to Denmark. It's a common um, challenge we face um, as academics uh, as being part of the academic ecosystem uh, and it's only as strong as the weak uh, academic freedom is only as strong as the weakest link um, there can be no academic freedom uh, if it doesn't also uh, hold for your colleagues um, so Amanda said in her, her presentation that one of the most important thing we can do is to create a culture of academic freedom. And that culture starts, I would say, in the PhD education. Uh, that's the future uh, of academia. That's those who are going to teach our students in the future and conduct the research and communicate to society. Um, and that's where all the parts of, uh, of academia meets. It's where we teach, we learn, we do outreach, and we do research. Um, and all four aspects has to be embedded uh, with academic freedom. And 
there are many layers of creating a culture um, of academic freedom uh, among early career researchers, and we hold a huge responsibility ourselves. And I think many of us are aware of that. Uh, and it is a discussion that many of the people who sit in this room, they have uh, been part of um, in, in different settings across Europe. Uh, and here I must say that I am extremely privileged as having done my PhD in Sweden, um, because I have probably the best conditions as had probably the best conditions as a doctoral candidate as I could have. And of course, there are issues with the Swedish PhD education as well. Don't worry, I can give you a list. Um, but I have a security in terms of my supervisor and a co-supervisor, but I also met it through the entire system. I have the right to be a member of a labor union, a trade union. I have someone who advocate uh, my representational rights. I have student status. So I'm also a part of the governmental system of the university governance. I served in a university board myself. I'm listened to, I'm challenged. Thank God for that um, or thank uh, whatever. Um, God might not have so much to do in this conversation. Um, and I challenged, and there was room for that. Uh, so I have uh, definitely uh, discussed with Peter's colleagues uh, and challenged their point of views. And that's a privilege uh, that I wouldn't have everywhere in Europe as a doctoral candidate. And I have to take the opportunity when I have it, um, and I have to, to advocate for uh, academic freedom. I have to take the conversation, but there has to be someone to take the conversation with. And this is where I think that universities can do much more at all level. They can take this conversation. Um, take. I'm, I'm certain that right now it's spoken a lot about academic freedom in the university boards of Stockholm, not university boards of Sweden in general, but it was not a conversation we had a lot when I was in Stockholm University Board. And in that sense, the conversation is taken too late. Um, we should take it, I would almost say daily at the lunch table in the research group. And that's not a place where I talked a lot about academic freedom. I talked a lot about other things, but not academic freedom. And academic freedom is the core value that underlies the entire system in this. Um, if we don't have it, then, and don't have it in all its aspects, that it extends to teaching, learning, research, and outreach, then what is the role of the university and what is what is our role in it? But if we are to have academic freedom, on the other hand, I also have to have the conditions that provides it to me as an individual researcher. I have to have some security that if I dare speak against my supervisor, that I won't lose my funding. Because if that is on the line, where is my academic freedom? And that also holds to our students. They have to challenge us in the lecture rooms, ask questions, and engage, because this is all about engagement into society, in a research group, and so much more. But there's also we but it also comes with a responsibility for us as researchers, and that is how we do it. And Academic freedom is not an excuse for not having good manners. Um, you can be polite. You, your academic freedom is not, my academic freedom is not worth more than your academic freedom. And I, and we should back each other in it. Um, and it holds both that I should acknowledge when I teach my students right to academic freedom, but it also holds the other way around, I would say, I am part of a society. Um, so with governance and state and all of that, I also have a huge responsibility to take research and research practices and why knowledge and why knowledge based on research matters out into society. 
And I have to also, I, if I want the right to challenge Peter, I better also acknowledge the work they do when it is good, because it's about the conversation. We have to be able, if I have to finish one place, then academic freedom is for, for me, it's dignity, it's trust, it's tolerance, as Anna said yesterday, that's what she wants, first of all, her students to take with when they go out into the world. And it's an ongoing conversation and it doesn't stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peel. I was wondering uh, that basically in the discussion, everything about academic freedom was already said from uh, several perspectives, which I really appreciate that we have a, a really, um, really big view on the on the problem. I was wondering, uh, what are our responsibilities as individual researchers regarding academic freedom? If I may ask you to answer really shortly, because we are running out of time and I would like to allocate time for one, two questions from the audience. Phil, please. To take the conversation and to respect other people's academic freedom. Okay, so it was already said. Uh, so then uh, the audience can repeat my question <laughs> if somebody wants, but... Uh, so then I open the discussion and the questions from the public. Okay, so I think you were first. No, you need the mic. Uh, you need the mic. Yeah, because we record it and... <laughs> well... I think I we need other one. Anyway, Sorry, where does academic freedom end? Well, I guess one, one border is the um, ethical considerations. Uh, so it's not absolute that you can't do everything, but that's, I think, is a, a common trait. It's to freedom connects always responsibility. And you were talking also about that showing respect and that so so it's it's not uh, you can do whatever you like so there are a lot of constraints i think but one is also the ethical issues that we have been talking about now and and there are on on genetics and and other uh, stuff there are lots of discussions and then i would also say on a personal level it also it also ends if you infringe others academic freedom uh, and i think it's really important as a researcher like, you should never be afraid of saying that this is when something is a challenge for academic freedom, but you should also consider when you should also take responsibility for having a healthy conversation um, about like to take the conversation uh, and to answer the question. The question should also be asked asked reasonably uh, in the perfect world it not always is but from like it's really hopefully academic freedom never ends because it's a conversation and it has to go on and on and on um but there can be um and i guess we all know we all have that feeling sometimes that we are quick to feel not just about academic freedom but feel that we are attacked when people question our ways of doing things uh, and I think as with academic freedom as with everything else it's very good to consider where is the question coming from where is the challenge coming from um, and and talk Shana? Could, I, could I just add add a point about this the conversation issue if I may I, I would say I, I cannot agree 
strongly enough with this point about the conversation and I think it also has to be a positive conversation as well as a negative conversation and I think what we see a lot is people talk about academic freedom and they talk about infringement of institutional autonomy when there's a big problem to actually address it's not talked about as a kind of day-to-day -day issue and enough I think within institutions so I don't think it's just about we've got a huge problem how do we respond to that it's also about you know um, what are the, what are examples of good practice? Like I said earlier, how you know how can you sort of pick out things you're doing day to day that that actually underline these issues and underline these values? Um, so I just wanted to back up your point that I, I think it absolutely has to be an ongoing conversation and not one which is always in a panic situation when there's a problem, but one which is kind of part of the norm of university discourse. Okay, I mean, to your question about uh, you know, limits to academic freedoms, there, of course, just like I said, there are ethical considerations. You don't do research as you did in Auschwitz, right? Uh, but also, I would like to comment on uh, the first question that was put here about uh, what is the individual responsibility regarding academic freedom. I would say integrity. Uh, and I will connect it to, to open science uh, discussion we had both uh, earlier and also in an earlier session. Uh, and I will refer to an old Bologna declaration from 1988 that the academia should be morally independent of political and economic power holders. And that is a question of integrity. We, are, we are cannot be sold. Uh, and there is a lot of discussions have been, even in research council in Sweden a few years ago, that we should actually measure, uh, do assessment of research in relations to uh, how useful or what impact it does in society. We all want interaction with society and actually that our knowledge may, may make some difference. But if that means that Polit politicians or economic power holders actually define what they find useful. If that is a quality criteria, then we're on the wrong path. Quality is something we need to define ourselves. And the same thing that what is very useful or very popular, I mean, McDonald's food is very popular. It doesn't mean it's the best quality, right? So I think integrity, I think, is a very important world in relation to your question before. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question, who raised, yeah, can allocate. Do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you for a nice discussion for all the panelists. Um, uh, I wonder about, um, so especially for PhD students and early researchers, the career paths in general is a bit more um, precarious and, and there's a lot of temporary positions and uh, you can call it the power dynamics is a little bit they are in the weaker end of that uh, stick so to speak um in your view what are the more practical measures that, that we can implement or or ensure to implement to ensure academic freedom for phd students or early researchers um in light of the let's say general conditions for these researchers but also for example maybe an, an extra example of um, um, political change that significantly impacted, for example, international researchers, uh, some of whom regarding the migration law, for example, when it was changed, uh, some international researchers who do research in some maybe sensitive topics, uh, when they came, for example, from abroad, and uh, they did discussion, or they did research in cert certain topics, if there's no uh, st stable conditions for them, and they were risking, let's say, stability in terms of living, if they if they to go back to let's say where they are, where they are from, they could face some some, um, to say the least, some troubles, if not even more serious consequences. So the question is, what practical measures can be taken to ensure such uh, uh, to to ensure academic freedom for this uh, young researchers? I say, Pierre, with, with more start? conditions. Yeah. So I would start to say to 
to to steal the words from Jacob and say that uh, walk the walk. The university should also walk the walk uh, and have representation um, um, of uh, not only doctoral candidates, which is the case in, in Sweden, but also uh, postdocs uh, and other precarious uh, early career researchers. Uh, invite them to the table uh, where decisions are made that infects them. Uh, because in the conversations with all your staff, all your students, uh, that's where the good solutions are found. Uh, and uh, like walk the walk and they'll be challenged by me and my peers. Um, and I think it is, uh, like I must say, I think it is more of a dance and I think it is a very good dance um, because I think we all want the same at the end of the day. Um, I think that all of us uh, holds a huge responsibility for, to speak up for the most vulnerable in our system. And that is those who risk uh, their life or their freedom if they go, uh, if they return, uh, if they cannot remain where they are doing um, their research. Um, so I, um, so I think it is important that we take the conversation and continue to take the conversation and also continue to talk about research uh, in general. The whole paradigm about open science, um, it, for me, it's a value. Uh, open science is a value, just like academic freedom and research integrity, and we should talk much more about them. Um, and also, like, advocate for those who can't advocate themselves. If I might continue, I would, uh, I would say that for for a university system and academic system, it's so important to build it into the idea of excellence, of quality, and of merit. So you got me the idea now that next time I talk to my professors, I should ask, what are you doing to ensure academic freedom for your PhD students? And, and so and it needs to be implemented very differently in different fields and different funding system, et cetera. But you can always ask the question and that put it on the table and that will make it a little bit more central, at least. I just like to add to your question that uh, apart from the obvious, you know, employment conditions, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, according to my experience, is that if you look at look at my university, Lund University, I mean, in the 80s, I mean, in medical faculty, there were hundreds of departments. Uh, and I think that, okay, I use the word feudalism, this kind of dependence on supervisors and your superiors uh, is much bigger in small units. Uh, so I would dare to say that uh, to have bigger departments, bigger research institutions, that you are a bigger collective of PhD students and so on. You have more power, you, you can claim your rights as someone who can raise their voice and so on, which may be difficult when you're very dependent on individuals. So it's very difficult to change supervisor too, it's a very small unit. So, so I think bigger units help so little. So one of the so things I'm, that I'm very thankful uh, for in this setting is that um, it's that it's not questioned that academic freedom should extend to doctoral candidates. And it is so important to remember that that is actually questioned in some places. Um, I do, as a doctoral candidate, uh, I did research, I published academic freedom, also the research freedom should extend uh, to doctoral candidates. Um, but I don't think you should stop with that, just ask your professors. I also think you should ask your postdocs. Um, they are in Sweden the most, Peter, the most vulnerable. Uh, the postdocs, um, and they need a place at the table uh, to actually voice their concerns. And in many places, they don't have it. And we lose so much valuable information from them. Amanda? Yes, want... thanks. I, I just wanted to add that I think this is also, this touches all aspects, I think, of, of universities. And I think one place where we need to have this debate is in thinking about career assessment. So there's lots of discussions at the moment around research assessments and career assessments and looking at new ways to really incentivize researchers, incentivize academics, um, and just look at the, uh, how we assess careers in a broader way. And I think absolutely to bring in things like um, integrity and academic freedom and adhering to values, passing these on to students, embedding them in the university activities, that's something that could absolutely be part of that whole uh, career assessment package and part of that debate as well. So um, I think it's about making sure, as I think somebody said, that it's embedded everywhere that it's actually relevant.
Thank you very much. I need to apologize. Uh, however, we do not have enough time to allocate uh, next questions now, but I strongly advise to continue discussion during coffee break, which will be now. And I would like uh, strongly thank to all the panelists. Uh, it was a great pleasure for me to moderate the panel and uh, also for all the audience. And thank you very much that you were here today with us. So